Uh, so it's my great pleasure to announce someone who, slightly disturbingly, I, I realised I, I, I've known for 26 years now, uh, since my salad days as a reporter on the Leicester Mercury. Uh, the Right Honourable Keith Vass is, of course, Chairman of the Commons Home Affairs Committee, having been re-elected to that post by MPs earlier in this Parliament. And so without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Keith. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, we remember Mark, um, not quite Mark and his salads, um, but Mark in Leicester, and we, we still miss him. Uh, and uh, we're glad to see that he's done so very well in becoming such a prominent uh, part of the BBC. And can I begin by congratulating Norman Fowler on becoming the new chairman of the Hansard Society. Um, Norman is someone I've known for all the time I've been in Parliament. I've never had the privilege of having Norman as a witness, uh, unfortunately. Um, but uh, it's great to see you take up this position. Uh, Sarah is here. Uh, Sarah and I were lucky enough to be re-elected to our positions uh, recently. Uh, this will be my ninth year as chair of the Home Affairs Committee. There was a little quirk when they wrote the rules, which meant that you could only serve two full terms. Um, and as one does when one has a glass of water, is it full or is it half full or half empty? Uh, we were not quite there, so I was able to... Uh, to stand again, um, though I did say when the process began uh, to Kiki, who works with me on Home Affairs, that if I saw another immigration officer or police officer again, I would probably feel slightly ill. But I've taken the plunge. Uh, this is uh, the age of select committees. This is a time that I think Norman St. John Sievers, when he set up select committees, did not uh, envisage where select committees have become, in my view, equal to the chamber in setting the parliamentary agenda. And if you have a good committee, and I've been very fortunate in the last eight years to have some pretty impressive personalities sitting on uh, home affairs, and if you have some good material, you can make a big difference to the way in which uh, government operates. Because I think we have two client groups in setting the agenda. We have the public, because they are watching what we are doing in great numbers, thanks to the BBC Parliament channel. But also we have the government. And um, even though we are very nice to colleagues, and I've just come back from a, a private meeting with the Home Secretary, which we do once every five years, um, when Parliament begins, and we're nice to each other, we will turn nasty tomorrow uh, when she becomes our witness. Um, it's important to have good relations with government, but also for government to understand that we are, not, we are critical friends. We are there to help ministers do a better job. We are there to find things that they cannot find. And if they use us well, then it can be very successful. And I suppose if I was looking at the best example of, of how successful we have been in the last eight years, it would be the recommendations that we made on giving citizenship to Gurkhas we passed the report on the Tuesday by the Wednesday, thanks to a wonderful uh, set piece between Joanna Lumley and Phil Woolis, who was then the immigration minister. Gordon Brown accepted the five recommendations that we made, and by Thursday, the government had decided to give Gurkhas uh, citizenship. Um, I'm sure Sarah and I would like that to happen to every one of our reports. Um, that is just an example of it going very, very well. Um, we need to, I think, um, ensure that we are sensible in what we do, that we treat witnesses well. This constant view of the media, that we grill our witnesses. Just imagine putting uh, uh, Theresa May or James Brokenshire on a grill and grilling them. Uh, but they love saying this, and actually we don't do that. We rely on them giving us information uh, and us being able to ask those pertinent questions. But I think what we've done in Home Affairs, and what I hope we will continue to do, and I will set out part of our agenda later, is to make sure that um, we have covered the big bases, immigration, policing, the justice and Home Affairs agenda of the um, European Union, and counter-terrorism. And within that, there's so much uh, other work to do. My final point is, I'd like to see the next five years for us develop an even stronger relationship with uh, the public. Uh, I like it when the public write in and say, we would like you to do a report on a subject that's of interest to them. 
the reason why we drive Calais so hard is because, because I get a lot of emails from Kent, uh, and therefore we feel we should drive it hard. Uh, I allow every member of the committee one inquiry of their own, uh, not just for one year. If they come up with any other ideas within five years, then they're able to choose it. Otherwise, it gets boring when I choose all the ones myself. So though it's a committee as a whole, each member of the committee can choose one. And we also allow the public to do this, and I would like to see that develop even further in the work we're doing on counter-terrorism. We want a big conversation with the Muslim community, so I'm going to take the committee out of Westminster, and we're going to cover at least uh, 10 of the big cities, listening to what the community says. I think that's what Parliament and select committees should be about. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Some very interesting thoughts there that I'm sure we'll be picking up as the discussion proceeds. Um, Sarah Williston, Dr. Sarah Williston, I should say, is a GP who came in and chaired the Commons Select Committee, was the first, I think, of the 2010 intake to chair a Commons Select Committee, and was, again, re-elected to that post uh, at the start of this new parliament. Uh, Sarah, if I could invite you to tell us about your agenda for the coming five years. Well, thank you very much, and uh, and thanks for, for coming. And I'd just like to start by thanking Hannah White. Is, is Hannah here? Yes, Hannah, thank you, uh, for your fantastic report uh, from the Institute for Government, which actually looked at the role of select committees and, and, and really emphasised that point about is it about making a headline or is it about making a difference? And, and I think that's a really important point to reflect on for all select committees as, as they move forward into this parliament, as to how can we actually change the agenda. And there, there's many ways that we can do that. We can do that by holding our inquiries. But if we focus those on emerging areas of policy, I think that's where we're most likely to make a difference so that we can contribute to the debate. So, for example, we know that uh, the government is at some point in the late autumn or winter going to launch their uh, childhood obesity strategy. And I think there's a real role for select committees in allowing all of those who've accumulated the evidence base uh, on this to be able to give voice to that so that we can put the evidence out there in the public domain and examine it to actually make recommendations as to what can feed in to emerging policy. So I think that's a very important role for select committees. And of course, there are things that we can do in the midst of a storm. If we take, for example, in the last parliament, the uh, concern there was about Ebola and uh, whether or not we should be putting health workers into some kind of quarantine on their return. There's a very real danger for that. Um, there was no evidence that that was necessary. It could have potentially deterred health workers from going out to take part. So I think there's a role for select committees in the midst of those kinds of issues to hold a, a, a public hearing where you can actually reassure the public to allow the experts to come in and, and present the evidence in a calm way um, to, to allow all those fears to, to be voiced. And, and coming to the point that, uh, that Keith made earlier about engaging with the public, what we decided to do in the run-up to that hearing was to invite the public to tell us what they were worried about so that we could make sure we addressed all those fears in that, in that hearing and we weren't leaving anything out. And it's about holding people feet to the flames as well during those uh, those sessions about you know how how do things sometimes go wrong what are the processes that government are using so i think there are there are real opportunities for health select committees to uh, for the health committee and for other committees to to have a role in that way um, I think there's important work that we can do around uh, pre- and post-legislative scrutiny. We, in the last parliament, uh, we looked at uh, what had been the um, unintended consequences of the Mental Health Act. And again, I think that's an important um, role for committees. And then, of course, there are pre-appointment hearings. I mean, interestingly, that's just been bypassed and the, uh, the chair of the new body, um, NHS Improvement, which is the merger of the, the TDA and Monitor, um, that has gone ahead without a, um, a pre-appointment hearing, which I think is a shame because I think it is important that, um, that committees have the opportunity to, in public, hear the views of those people who are going to be playing such an inferential role in, in, a, in a body like NHS Improvement. So, and then there is the, um, the other areas we have around um, holding government's feet to the flames. Um, and if we look, for example, in the last parliament, the work that we did um, around the urgent and emergency care review, 
it allows people to say, well, this is an area of real public concern, what has happened about waiting times in A&E. So let's bring in all those who are responsible um, and actually hear what's going well and what's going badly. Uh, and I, again, I think that's uh, something that we can usefully continue into the, the next parliament. So what are the issues now for the NHS? I think overwhelmingly the key issue is going to be how do we make the NHS work within the funds that we have available? How realistically um, can, we, um, can we save 22 billion over the next five years? And what will that mean in practice? So I think there's an enormous piece of work around that. Um, and likewise, I think around the whole issue of the NHS workforce. So I think those are probably two key areas but I think as well that there is something about the committees interacting with the public to hear what they would like um, um, committees to look at in the next five years. So I'm interested to, to hear from you how you think all, all of the um, select committees can do that. Um, I've used a lot of social media in the last parliament to not only tell people who is coming to the committee, but very often to invite them um, to comment on the areas that uh, they would like to, uh, the questions they would like asked. Now, clearly, you can't ask every question that you get tweeted on social media, but what emerges very often are key themes, and sometimes those are themes that, uh, that you might not have, have actually thought about. And the final point I would like to make, drawing on Hannah's report, is the importance for committees of reviewing how effective they've been afterwards. And that isn't something that the Health Committee uh, did in the last Parliament, but I think it's very important. So I shall take that forward um, from your report, Hannah, to, to look at how we can do that constructively. Uh, and finally, the issue of how we treat our witnesses. Um, it is a, a stressful experience coming before a select committee. And, and I think it is regrettable that sometimes um, you get committee members who grandstand, um, committee members who harangue witnesses. And I, I don't think that is the way forward. Um, I think that you get more out of people if you have a constructive dialogue with them and help to, um, help to encourage them to tell you what they want to say. But there does come a point, of course, with an obstructive witness um, where that is a last resort that, uh, that, that Parliament does need to express the public's view about their conduct. But I think that should be a last resort, but interested again to hear your views on that. What, what are the reasonable limits for, for interviewing our witnesses? Um, and it, it did come home to me after uh, one of our hearings in the last Parliament where um, somebody who worked for a major charity wrote to the committee afterwards and said that... Uh, that he had found it a particularly bruising experience coming before the select committee. And, and I think that that was because there was a very reasonable challenge about the way this charity had spent public money, um, so money that had been raised from charitable donations, in a way that a lot of members of the committee felt deeply unhappy about. And so I think there was a, it was right that there was challenge. But it, I think it is a shame if the experience of that afterwards leaves um, people who give evidence feeling that it was too much of a bruising experience. So it's important to get that balance right. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. Thank you. Well, um, I'm, what I'm proposing to do in a moment is open it up to questions, but uh, Chair's privilege, I think I'm going to ask one of my own first, if I can. I was intrigued by, Keith, your comment that this is the age of the select committee, and select committees are now potentially as important as the chamber. I just wondered if I could get you to look at kind of the trajectory select committees have been through. In the last parliament, when it was a hung parliament, there were moments when particular committees, I'm thinking of the health committee during the health and social care bill, the government's health reforms of uh, blessed memory, uh, were being considered and paused and rewritten, uh, where the health committee was phenomenally influential. There have been moments when the banking commission that was set up to look at banking rules essentially rewrote the government's legislation. Now, that was all in uh, the era of a coalition government in a hung parliament. Does the return of a majority in the Commons chamber make you a bit less influential? Do you think that the government's majority is actually a bit notional? How much influence do you think committees have in the new post-2015 election, Keith? Yes, I think you're right. Uh, it does make us less influential. It was much better when we had a coalition. Uh, because we could play off the Liberal Democrat um, when they were around and make sure sometimes 
uh, they were uh, able to keep the balance of the committee going. Uh, it depends very much on the personalities. There are usually those whose careers are over, like me, uh, and they're the rising stars. I happen to have uh, quite a few new members um, who I think will make their impact on the committee. Um, and I, I say to them, if you really want to be promoted, and of course that's why many of them come into Parliament to become ministers, um, you need to be really tough on the ministers. Because if you're nice to them, then the whips will keep you on here and be very nice to you. So the more aggressive you are, um, the more likely it is that they will try and buy you off with ministerial office or becoming a PPS. And that's happened to three of the people who sit on Home Affairs. We will never be where I want to be, Mark, which is where the uh, committees in the United States are. The, in, the committee chair of um, Homeland Security has an enormous staff, is hugely independent, and their members are hugely important people in their own right. Um, we will never be there because the power of patronage is such uh, and the influence of the party, uh, the party, which means actually the government, is so big that people try very hard not to be too critical um, of government when you're in government. I think that was the problem when we had a Labour government too. Um, it just so happened we had an, a number of mavericks on the Labour side and they kept voting against what the government wanted to do, which was pretty good. Um, but this is, this is our time, and I think we can, we can inch forward, um, but uh, unless we get those resources um, necessary to do the job as effectively... You know, we were promised, Sarah may not know this, but we were promised select committee offices for chairs next to the select committee staff, so you wouldn't have to keep going over to Millbank or wherever, that you'd actually have, as you have in France or the United States, the select committee room... And, you know, the chair would be there and next to the chair would be the staff. This does not happen here, uh, of course, because somebody forgot to buy Curtis Green and therefore it went off to um, the Metropolitan Police. Otherwise, we'd all have our own uh, offices and our staff next to them. But there's more to be done, but we're far behind what the Americans have done. Sarah? I think that, uh, yes, it's nice to know that we could have had a palace, but we, we don't. <laughs> but... Uh, um, I think that uh, having a majority government makes select committees even more important. I agree with Keith, and I think they're a, a now a vital part of holding government to account. And I think they'll be, um, they're far more effective if members are able to leave their party politics at the door. That gets much harder the nearer you get to an election. So I, I and we're, we yet to see what the, the current um, committees, how they will behave. Will they be able to do that? And I think that does take to a certain extent a lot of restraint from members um, and to, to, to behave as, uh, as constructively as they can. Um, and the balance is so important, that balance between um, holding the government's feet to the flames but developing a constructive relationship so that you are in a position not to be seen just as a threat, um, as an organisation that needs to be batted out the way and ignored as much as possible and sidelined as much as possible. But getting that balance right, I think, is hugely important in, um, in, in sort of holding to account and developing and having an impact on emerging policy. Right, at that point, I'd like to open it up to the floor. Can I, before we do, just a quick housekeeping point. The microphones you see in front of you are not actually functioning. So what I'd like to do is get uh, my assistants around the room to bring the radio mics to people who want to raise a question. So who would like to kick off? Ah, oh, we have a lot of them here. Uh, so gentlemen in the green sweater, green part of the thing. Thank you. Um, uh, I've question about could, the, I, could I get you to say your name? Sorry. Oh, sorry, my name is Andrew Smith. A um, uh, question about the way you operate. I'm interested in the way you operate. If there was a person of the other party in your position, how do you think your agenda for the next uh, parliament would be different? And also, I, I find it fascinating watching the hearings and how some committees work as a group and some committees are in clearly an open revolt against each other. How do you keep your committee together and stop fighting with the members, as sometimes you see? Keep that. Uh, yes, it would be different, uh, and sometimes uh, I made it a point that in the last five years that I would uh, get every member of the committee to chair Home Affairs, uh, obviously not the glamorous witnesses, 
um, uh, but uh, um, give them the chance to be able to see what it was like to chair. And I'm delighted to say three of them stood uh, for the chairships of other committees. One of them, Nicola Blackwood, got in. Tim Lawton nearly got in. T.C. Davis was another one. He now chairs Wales. So we've got quite a few of our former members who chair committees. Um, I think it would make a difference. They would have a different um, idea of what they want to do. You'd probably get less immigration if it was anyone other than me. I'm very keen on immigration issues because I have a big caseload, so it comes up an awful lot. But if it was David Burroughs, for example, it would be drugs, psycho... Uh, you know, he's very into trying to get... Not into drugs, but <laughs> into making sure we have a good agenda on drugs. If it was Tim Lawton, it would probably be Goddard, child abuse, children's stuff. Um, and, you know, I don't know about the new members. If it was David Winnick, it would be policing or surveillance. So, yes, it would make a difference. Um, but I think that um, uh, at the end of the day... Um, you keep them together by uh, being very nice to them, of course, buying them birthday cards, <laughs> and reminding them all that if a report is unanimous, then it's so much more effective. I think we've only had in the last eight years three, four, four or five reports that have been voted against by one particular member who just thinks he should do this to get his opposition on the record. And I keep pointing out they won't get to the end They'll only look at the summary. They get to know that you voted against this. So um, I think it would make a difference. I think the personalities of the chair, I mean, having Sarah there um, with a very difficult task of keeping my sister in order, uh, which I have not been able to do for 58 years, uh, I'm sure she did it more effectively. I think it is quite difficult. Um, thanks, Andrew. I think one of the things that helps is that the chairs are elected by the whole house. So in other words, if you're clearly very partisan in your approach, you're not going to be elected by the whole house. I think it's a great concern that, uh, for example, the SNP appointed um, their chairs. So the, the two chair positions they had, they decided among themselves there was going to be a sole applicant uh, rather than an election. Now, I think that's a, a regret, regrettable, and that's not a criticism of the individuals who, who have taken up the roles. I, I, you know, they, may, they may well be fantastic, but it's not the point. The point is that elected chairs on principle should be um, are more likely to be impartial if they command the respect of the whole house. And if all co select committee chairs were appointed, I think that we would soon return to the old ways of it uh, being very partisan. So I think that's one point I would make. Um, secondly, I think that um, how do you keep a committee together? Well. It, to some extent, there are some personalities that can't be kept together. Um, so try as you like. Um, but where possible, if you take a collegiate approach, you make sure that everybody has the opportunity to have their voice heard, um, that you make sure that everybody knows that they'll, they'll be, have the opportunity to be brought in um, and that to contribute to the subjects for your inquiries, that they should be voted on by the whole committee. So my, my approach would be to try to avoid taking sort of executive decisions that this is what the committee is going to do, but to try and include everybody and listen to their views and try and reach consensus. Won't work every time. Thanks very much. I, I, I think what I'll attempt to do is now take two questions at a time. So perhaps if we can ask the lady in the red dress at the front there. The microphone's coming your way. Hi, um, Becky Forrow from the National Deaf Children's Society. Um, I just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about what it is that makes you choose the subject for an inquiry. I mean, Keith said that he already he gives um, each of his members an option for an inquiry. Sarah, you mentioned the public input. I mean, is that just about numbers, or is there something else that makes you make that decision? I'd just like to hear a bit more about that. Thanks very much. And one more. Gentleman in the blue suit over there. Um, particularly to Keith Vaz, I'm oh, sorry, Phil Larkin, uh, I work in the scrutiny unit here. Um, particularly to Keith Vaz, but Sarah as well. Um, Keith, as you've been through the process of being appointed and elected, um, it's been said that, um, that the committees have become more assertive now that they're elected and the chairs have become more assertive now they're elected. Is there any, having been through both, can you say if there's anything tangible that you're doing differently now uh, that you weren't doing before when you were appointed? I'll ask Sarah to have a go at those two first of all. Well, shall I start with Becky's question then? Um, because I think that's very important. I think there are various considerations. How 
how much opportunity is there for you to make a difference to emerging policy? How important is the issue? Um, and also, as you say, how, how important is it to the wider public? Uh, what I've asked people to do who want the committee to consider an inquiry, because you get deluged with requests um, the minute you're, you're elected, is to present a, a pitch, if you like, on a single side of A4, with as many links as you want on for further reading if people want to do that, but to try and express what it is you, why you think the issue matters, why is it important, what you're hoping the, the committee could consider within its terms of reference, and what it could change. And if you can't express that it would be those three things, then it's not likely that it's going to be um, taking up the time of the committee, given all the competing interests, because that's, that's the point. Um, we're already around um, 60 issues on our long list for the committee. So what I will do then in, in, October, in September, um, we will look at all those issues that have been raised with us on our long list. We'll whittle it down to a short list, and then it will be by vote of the whole committee rather than, than me deciding uh, myself what we should, uh, what we should consider. Could I get you to deal with the point, I mean, obviously you've known nothing but it being elected, but what difference do you think it would have made to have been appointed instead? To have been appointed? Well, um, as I say, I think the trouble with, with being appointed, if we go down that route for all committees as being the way it happens, is that the, you know, it will be appointed by the wits. That's how it will happen, and I think that will um, diminish the, uh, the influence and, and role of select committees, because I think that by having to command the whole house that's how you keep chairs independent-minded, and I think that's what the public would like to see. Keith Harris, so both the choice of subjects for inquiries and the difference it's made being uh, elected as opposed to appointed. It was fairly obvious that we would start our first session with Calais. Um, I know that Hannah doesn't like the idea of being driven by headlines, but in order to make a difference, you need a headline to help you make a difference. If you have a report and it's never in the newspapers, and nobody takes any notice of you. Frankly, the government won't do anything. There isn't a, some great civil servant sitting there thinking, oh, I must publish this report, I must take these recommendations. Government needs to know that you're on their backs, and we have to have a relationship with the press that allows this to happen. And we saw movement on Calais before we had the session with James Brokenshire. Lo and behold, we had a statement from the Home Secretary on Calais, an update on Calais. And before we have her in tomorrow, last Thursday, uh, Wednesday, we had a statement on water cannons, because she knows the very first question we ask her is, what's happening about these water cannons? So <laughs> I think you've got, you've got to take what's in the public domain, and that's why we've got a hot list um, of topics that are, that are hot, and one that is very hot is CT. Um, unusually, the Prime Minister is leading us on this because today he made a speech on Birmingham. Tomorrow, we've got Mark Rowley in to talk about counterterrorism, and the, the Home Secretary to the first set of questions, don't tell her this uh, because she's not supposed to know, uh, will be about um, uh, Tunisia and, and terrorism and the counter narrative. Um, so um, I think we need, the, we need the press. Without the press, I think we don't have the power to get things done. Uh, Elected appointed, I've actually been, Phil, in the unusual position of being elected three times, because the first time, um, the then Conservative opposition with the Liberal Democrats opposed my election because the Committee of Selection did, hadn't sat, and it was getting to the recess, so the government just put a motion down with my name on it, um, which was very kind of them. Uh, and then the second time re-elected. Of course, I'm not as popular as Sarah. Sarah is the most popular member of parliament, uh, having got 500 votes, my 419 are 100 behind Sarah's. I think what helped her was her opponent. Uh, <laughs> I, I must choose my own opponent next time. Um, but uh, uh, I think it, it's made no difference uh, to me because I think people understand what we're doing there. It does help sometimes if you have a dispute. The one occasion when I think the committee and I were going in a different direction, um, uh, I did say to them, well, actually, I have been elected by the whole House, and therefore, if I do this, it is uh, because I have that mandate, but, of, but we must work together on this. So um, there are very, very few disputes uh, on home affairs uh, about direction. Um, I think there's a big case for 
paying people an allowance for sitting on select committees. It is hard work. We get paid to do this work. Um, people compare it to that of the junior minister. I think they're absolutely right. I think I, I'm working harder now than I ever worked as a junior minister. Um, and, of course, you get less staff. You don't get a car. You don't get people bringing your coffee in and things. <laughs> Sarah, would you like a, a coffee bringer? Uh, I do. Yes, of course. But, um, uh, but th th the point I'd like to come back on as well is around choosing subjects for your inquiries. That there are other things that select committees can do around subjects, and that is where things um, happen, um, like, for example, you, you might not have escaped your notice that the, the government dumped the commitment to, um, to the, the Dilnot Commission recommendation. So into the long grass has gone the cap on care costs two days before Parliament goes into recess, um, and on a Friday afternoon. I don't think that's acceptable. Um, it is now too late for us to hold their feet to the flames uh, on that. However, what I can do in my capacity as chair is write to them formally and put that letter in the public domain and expect a response, and for them to know that we're not going to forget that, and it'll be returning uh, when, the, uh, when the Secretary of State comes before the committee during that two weeks, because I think that's a very important issue um, and, and one of great interest to the public. And so we, we have a role, I think, do you not think, Keith, in, in also being able to, to not let those kinds of things slip through? Absolutely. Our next two questioners, please, who would like a go? Um, gentleman over there. Thanks, my name's Mark. Um, if you found out a PhD student was studying select committees, um, what would you want the thesis to focus on? <laughs> In other words, um, what would you like to find out about committees that you don't already know? Um, Which means you're writing a thesis. You want us to do your homework. <laughs> Thanks, uh, David Morgan. Um, as you're considering a topic, or after you've reported, there are now many opportunities uh, to debate and to question uh, in the chamber. What observations do you have about the relative effectiveness of these different means to raise issues arising from committee work? Uh, Keith, first of all, sorry, I didn't get David's point. What was the point? Uh, the opportunities to raise issues either as you're researching, as you're going through a topic or as you're after you've reported in, in the chamber with the various forum for debate and for different types of question? I didn't quite, I not, didn't quite get your question, David. Um, I'll answer that one. Yeah, you, you answer that Jesus one. I'll, I'll do Mark's thesis. <laughs> um, I think there's still a lot to discover. And what I would do is I'd do a comparison between the powers of the select committees here and, and those of congressional committees in the United States. Um, because that, to me, is where we have to end up. That is nirvana for me. Um, we need to be in a position where people um, are not just, uh, you know, people who get on the media, but are substantial figures where presidents need to come down uh, to the Hill and talk to you about what your committee is doing or you're invited up to the White House and you can't get things through because um, we've only ever had male presidents till now. Uh, he can't get things through unless he has the committee on his side. Um, government doesn't have to worry about that here. I think that um, Gordon Brown only spoke to me once when I chaired Home Affairs, and that was to tell me off, uh, because I attended a, uh, a rally in favour of an increase in police pay. Um, and second, and David, Cam David Cameron was much better. When he set up Levinson, he had myself, Alan Beath, and... Um, uh, Richard Ottaway, I think, um, in to see him, I, maybe not, no, John Whittingdale, uh, in to see us to talk about the terms of reference, which I thought was, was very flattering, very nice, um, but actually the right thing to do, so he could get up in Parliament and say, I've actually met the chairs of these three committees, and they all back what I'm doing, and it gives the government so much credibility when they say they've got the select committee on their side, it makes us feel really warm and loved. Um, and I still feel if the Home Secretary got up and said, I have given advance notice of my statement to the opposition spokesman and also to the chair of the select committee, she would do herself a power of good when it came to the next grilling that we gave her. I don't know whether you get the advance copies of the statement from... You do? No. no. I mean, you know, a simple thing like that could make a huge difference to their morale. 
Um, Sarah, David, perhaps I, I put you, I think David's point, it seemed to me, was what is the link between what goes on in the committee and what goes on in the chamber? How much do your uh, reports get debate, debated afterwards? Possibly should there be some way of kind of informing what you're in, going to inquire into in Parliament before it comes to your inquiry? Well, part of the problem, of course, is that we don't get the opportunity to debate our report until the government has responded. So um, is there a, a case for actually debating them sooner? Well, there's nothing to stop us going to the backbench business committee and, and asking for a debate then and a follow-up debate once the, the government has responded. But I think clearly, as, as Keith pointed out earlier, if you can actually um, use the media to, to highlight uh, what you're doing, that often has more effect on government. So if there's a, a very uh, clear um, and public and media response to your recommendations, that's far more helpful than if it uh, quickly passes into, in, in, into obscurity. So I think you need to use every opportunity you can. Um, and, and sometimes, of course, people will come to you because it's a, an issue of, uh, of great public interest. But, um, but the final point I, I would make is what role we have within the liaison committee to strengthen the work of committees. And I would like to see, for example, instead of the Prime Minister coming every week to do Prime Minister's questions, that at least once a month he has to come to the liaison committee. Because the trouble with PMQs is it's become kind of like meaningless pap that you get a, a response. And, and the, the liaison committee gives you more of an opportunity to, to follow up points. Um, whereas in the Commons chamber, a, um, a question can just be batted away that's less easy to do within the, uh, the, the format of the liaison committee. So I would say let's have three a month that are standard PMQs and one that's a longer hearing in front of the liaison committee, where you can then have the committee grilling the prime minister, you know, in relation to a report. I think that would also help to to raise the profile of, of committee work. And very quickly, uh, any hints for PhD students? Uh, I would say Jesus is coming. Look busy. So, <laughs> no, no, oh, no, no. I think, but there is more that select committees can do, and and I think that the ability to call people, um, and so, for example, if there's a an appointment and a committee has been bypassed, um, I think it is important that, that committees can flex their muscles and say, actually, we're not happy with that. Uh, we, we would like to interview this person. We don't agree that there should be an appointment without the opportunity through Parliament and, and the role of select committees to have their say. So, yes, I think there's far more that, uh, that select committees could do, and I'd like to see the liaison committee focusing on that in this Parliament. Interesting. Our next two questioners, please. Any more for any more? Lady at the back. Any, uh, and another one? The gentleman there, right. Uh, yeah, um, I'm Ros Mead. I'm the uh, parliamentary scrutiny lead at NHS England. So um, this question is for Sarah. Uh, a lot of the new members on the committee are themselves either health professionals or have had roles um, either with health-related charities or in other um, respects. Do you think that helps or hinders when you're holding government and its ALBs to, uh, to account? And our next question. Hi, uh, Toby Farmer. A uh, slightly tongue-in-cheek question, perhaps. You mentioned that uh, members of select committees have quite a high workload, uh, equivalent to that of junior ministers, and presumably also to senior ministers, uh, shadow cabinet members, etc. If we turn that around the other way, that to me suggests that perhaps the MPs that aren't any of those things perhaps have a bit of spare capacity. So is that the case? And if so, what could we do to usefully get uh, a bit more work or uh, <laughs> what kind of input uh, out of them? Sarah, first of all, then, too many health pro professionals, perhaps? Uh, party <laughs> pre-health professionals on your committee these I mean, days? clearly, if you had a health select committee composed entirely of, uh, of doctors um, who are members of the BMA <laughs> and other you know, allied health professionals who are members of Unite, and it starts to look like a union lobby, um, that is not helpful. And I think that it's very important that we have a balance with, with people who've been users and carers. And, of course, very many people are 
are all of the above. They have been users and carers as well. And so we do have on our committee members who haven't been health professionals, but who've had family experience, um, and that has driven their interest in health. Of course, it helps in many ways. If you have a, a witness before you and you've worked in the health service, it's easier to spot if they're talking nonsense, for example. So I think it is helpful, but it can become help unhelpful if it's too skewed um, towards health professionals. Is, is that your view, incidentally? from a more generalist approach as well, but I think we've certainly found that where there have been health professionals on the health committee, that's often kept the focus perhaps on the health issues being scrutinised. Yes, and I, and I think as well that when we look at the balance of the current committee, there are also uh, people who've worked, for example, in medical science, who've had experience within management, who've had experience um, within, uh, within managing in a, in a number of contexts. So, so I think we do have a good balance. I don't think the current committee is skewed too far towards um, a single interest group. Interestingly, we have two members of the committee who are from devolved nations, so that may also change the flavour of what we do in looking more comparatively across the whole of the UK, which I think will be, will be helpful too. Thank you. Thank you. The lazy, the lazy MP question. Um, I know that the public think that we're all terribly lazy and uh, lying around busy, but I think that it, it's anyone who spends time with MPs will know that it is an overwhelming job. I mean, I think I, the, just looking at the impact of correspondence on, on MPs, um, I often think I would love to have been an MP before emails came in. I mean, just in a two-hour period uh, last week um, over the, the issue around whether or not we should change the vote on hunting, my office had 800 emails in two hours. And, um, and the, 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 the volume of correspondence is, is rapidly becoming unmanageable. And I think to add into that the, the workload around being a select committee chair and a select committee member, if you're doing the job properly, and you're doing your background reading, it, it, it really is quite overwhelming at times. So. Well, Keith, can I ask you, how, do you, how on the Home Affairs Committee do you sort of accommodate people with a certain specialist knowledge? I don't know if you've ever had an ex-policeman, for example, on, on, on your committee or a, a, an ex-criminal lawyer or something like that. How, what, how, do, how do they play in a committee setting? Uh, well, we've got the DPP, the, an ex-DPP oh. on our committee, of course. Mm -hmm. Lots of lawyers. Um, the, the only policeman who put himself forward just managed to fail to get on, and we're really short of a policeman. These days you look for them and you can't find them. Uh, and I'm very, would be very keen to have one on, um, but he didn't get on. I think he lost by a few votes. Uh, Toby, Toby, shame on you. What is your job? Oh, well, then you've got plenty of time to think about these things as you go around your gardening. MPs... Yeah. Oh. Um, oh, you're quite if you could just hang on for the mic for a second. There you go. He's retracting. Watch this retraction. <laughs> no, no. The, the, some of it was around, the, the, obviously, the, the um, slightly lazy question about lazy MPs. But the other bit was, actually, you guys put an awful lot of effort um, and give a lot of value through the process. I think there are quite a few MPs who don't perhaps do that because they don't have the conduit to do it. How do you? Oh, um, how he's do you he's that? rephrased uh, because he was <coughs> taken aback. Well, not quite. He's not in tears yet. Um, <laughs> look, uh, it's we, we meet every Tuesday um, in preparation for Tuesday. Uh, I would meet my clerk on a Wednesday. We would go through questions on a Thursday. I'd go to Leicester on a Friday, I, and I say to Kiki, "Don't disturb me. I don't know anything about anything on a Friday. It's just Leicester." And by the Monday, we're into preparing for the session, and Tuesday, we're having the session. Um, for ordinary members of the committee, as opposed to the chairs, uh, I'd like to get them their papers on a Friday, Thursday or Friday, so they can read them, and uh, therefore add their own questions. Um, and it's, it's a lot of work. I think preparation for a, a, a non-chair is probably about two to three hours if they do it properly. Um, I know my sister, when I said, oh, you know, are you getting ready? What's your subject for on health? She'd say, oh, I'm preparing. She'd start her preparation on Sunday um, uh, for this. And I'd say, Sunday? I mean, that's so early. 
um, surely just pick up the papers and read them <laughs> as you go in. But I think that that applies to most members of the committee. They read everything very carefully. One of the unsung sung heroes are the clerks, who actually are not used. The scrutiny unit, I think, in the House is not used enough. Uh, they write some pretty brilliant briefs. Uh, and to give them uh, justice, you have to read them because they are that good. Uh, so I think that everyone does work very hard, Toby. Uh, not as hard as you do in Kew Gardens, um, planting all your trees. Uh, but uh, I think um, it is really an alternative career. I mean, Sarah may well end up, like John Whittingdale, as the Secretary of State for Health in the next Conservative government. Uh, you never know. Uh, she's a doctor, and we're very short of doctors as well. And not just in the NHS, but <laughs> here in Parliament. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we need that kind of expertise uh, vitally, in my view, if we're going to succeed. But, but joking apart, I mean, you, you raise a very important point about the, 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 the total absence of continuing professional development and proper professional appraisal within Parliament. is the thing that, one of the things that shocked me most when I came here, um, having been somebody that was involved in teaching junior doctors and medical students in my time before I came here, because there's nothing. Um, and uh, provided you, you turn off on time, say nothing and vote with the government, people will leave you alone. Uh, largely, but there is no process formally for uh, sitting down with MPs saying what are what are your special interests? What could you can what could you contribute? How can we help you to develop that interest to to be an effective spokesperson within a certain area? It simply doesn't happen, and I think that's why select committees have been such an important alternative route because that's the only opportunity really you have. That or all party groups, and of course all party groups have play an important role as well, but, they, they, but, um, but all political parties could do far, far more to, to help to develop um, the talents of all MPs. And I think that would, in, in many ways, help to tackle the burnout that, you, that, that we all see within colleagues here. Thanks very much. Well, our, our allotted time is drawing uh, peacefully towards its end, but I think we've got time for another round of questions, if we have one. Hannah. Sorry? Hannah. Hannah, Hannah. Dr. Hannah White of the Institute for Government has a question. Right of reply. <laughs> um, so just on the media point, um, Keith, I think I would totally accept um, that media is, is really very often, almost always necessary for, for committees, not only to put pressure on government, but um, also so that the public is aware of what committees are doing. I just think it's it shouldn't be the only thing that's being sought. Obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a means to an end rather than an end in itself. Mm, mm. Um, the question I wanted to ask um, was, obviously, you can see from just the two of you that committees approach their roles quite differently um, and obviously achieve different things. Do you think, do either of you think, I'm interested to know whether there could be a, and, and sorry, and one of the other things that, I've been thinking about is that it's quite hard for committees to get feedback on what they're doing except via the media or through the, through the whips essentially um, and that isn't something that committees have, have really been able to do very much to date. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there could be a role for m a sort of more structured form of, of feedback and evaluation of committees? Would that be helpful um, or is it not something that, that you think would has, has a role in the system? Okay. And any more questioners? Right. Uh, lady over there, if you like. Yeah, you. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> I can recall accompanying John Whittingdale to his last speech as a select committee chair, which was in this room talking about the local media, and he was, and this is only a couple of months ago, he was thinking, I'm not really sure what I'm going to be doing next. Well, now we know. Um, Keith, uh, do you, uh, term limits for chairs? We've got them, we I have, suppose. We have a term limit. Actually, Sarah also doesn't get caught by the term limit, because I think she succeeded Stephen Dorrell halfway through a parliament, so she can be there for 13 years if she's not Secretary of State. Um, probably uh, 13, 13 years is too long. I think I've had four Home Secretaries so far. 
uh, in the purely intellectual sense, you understand, um, uh, and uh, many junior ministers. Um, uh, and the witnesses do go round and round. I think I've had four commissioners, metropolitan police commissioners. So, um, you know, but it's nice to be able to plan ahead. What do we bring? I suppose um, we bring a certain, well, obviously experience, because we've been there a while. But the, the downside is that we, we have our own little um, ways of doing things, which might not be the best ways. And that's why it depends on the ability of the new committee members to push chairs in the right direction. I think sometimes they can be a little bit reticent to do that um, when they're new members. By the time you get to the end of the parliament, they're completely out of control. Uh, and uh, they will ask whatever questions they want. They won't even look at their briefing papers. They will demand inquiries on everything under the sun. And you just have to keep up with the insatiable demand that they have. Um, so I hope it helps. Um, and I hope it benefits people. There's only two members who are on, only David Winnick has been on there longer than me, uh, and Tim was in the last parliament. The rest have all changed. They just chose to change. I think Nicola would have stayed if she hadn't been elected as a chair. Um, and you know, w when it came to the elections, I kept telling pe more and more people to stand. It was like a freshers fair. I kept saying, I've only got eight people for five places. We need more, we need more. And some but the whips actually intervened to manage how many people stood. They didn't manage the election, they can't do that. But they managed people by saying, oh, you don't really want to go for home affairs because you won't get on. Why don't you try science or the petitions committee? Because you'll definitely get on that. And they robbed us of some very effective people. Um, on feedback, Hannah, you're absolutely right. That's why we rely on uh, the Institute of Government to give us feedback on, on what we're doing. Um, the liaison committee, I just want to say this to Sarah. I disagree that, you know, I think she, she's right that we need to have a, a new approach to PMQs. And perhaps Prime Minister should come to liaison once a month. But I actually think it would be a thrill for committee members to have once in a parliament the Prime Minister turn up to a, a committee uh, of the House uh, to talk about their subjects. Because, you know, there are three a year. I don't think we should make Prime Minister come more than three a year. Um, but if we had three a year, and that's what, five years, that's 15 committees. Some could double up, but I don't think you do much of the petitions committee or you know, the backbench business committee or the committee of selection. Um, or maybe combine what Sarah is suggesting, where he comes once a month for that committee session. So have um, a certain number of liaison there, but the rest should all be members of the health committee to talk about health. That I think I'd go along with. I wouldn't mind the prime minister doing once a month for that. But you know, I've, I've yet to find a prime minister who's been caught out by all the grandees sitting there asking these great piercing questions about the European Union. Um, he wins every time. And you know, when he takes his jacket off and rolls up his sleeves, I mean, he's won. Um, I don't think we can, we can do anything to sitting prime ministers. They are just, they're in command of everything, and we are probably, most of us, quite deferential to them. Sarah. I think on Hannah's point about feedback, yes, I think feedback's hugely important. And as a committee, you do get feedback from the public, you get uh, feedback from stakeholders, that's hugely important. Um, but I think you're absolutely right, formally, asking for feedback from our witnesses and asking departments, did it really make a difference? And in your report, you highlight the, the formal way that after six months, uh, one committee, I think the Foreign Affairs Committee, had gone back to say, what did we change or to follow up? And, and the fact that they knew they were going to be asked that um, seemed to, to push the pace a bit more. So that's something um, that I will be doing in this parliament. Can I just ask Ruth, because um, I'm having a s bit of a brain fade here, what is our um, start, uh, end time for this session? Eight o'clock. So sorry, when I said we hadn't got much time left, I was uh, getting in into something of a twist here. So uh, we have plenty of time for yet more questions, so come on down. The gentleman right at the back in the middle. Uh, Lewis van der Gaal. Um, you spoke briefly about all party groups. Um, is there any formal or informal working between you as chairs of committees and or party groups in terms of their own inquiries? I know you sit on them yourself, but is there any formal 
liaison between you and their chairs. And another questioner? Any more arms going up? Lady Ella. Uh, Melanie Surrey. You mentioned that the United States was your kind of role model for select committees. Um, what kind of reforms then, um, precisely, do you think are realistic to achieve uh, such an end? Or what reforms, in any case, would you uh, think wouldn't be necessary in the future? Okay, so perhaps, uh, Sarah, if I can take you first on this, your fantasy select committee reforms, first of all. <laughs> Fantasy Select Committee reform. What do what you mean in terms of what we could influence? What you would really like to... No, no in, in terms of powers. Oh, powers. Well, I would really like Keith. I, I would love to, to have the ability to, to draw, um, draw back gov government ministers and have uh, you know, much greater influence on what they do, to actually um, to, to bring them in and say, no, we're not happy with that policy. So when they make an announcement, actually bring them up and, and, and that have to go back and think again sometimes on, on some of the decisions that they make. Um, I think that would be a useful check. And to have more powers to, to, to be able to compel people to come um, before the committee. Uh, not, probably not quite as relevant as it is for your committee because we're, we're, mostly people will come anyway if we ask them. Um, Keith, you've, you've delivered on this, this subject a bit, but would you like, for example, to have the power for your committee to veto key public appointments in your sphere, DPP springs to mind as a possible person you might or might not like? Well, she, he belongs or she belongs to justice. Um, but yes, we'd love to appoint more people, the head of the NCA and others like that. Um, we only get asked when the government really messes things up, as they did with the child abuse inquiry. Having lost two chairs, the Home Secretary then said, I think we're going to ask the Home Affairs Select Committee to help us scrutinise. But, of course, she'd already decided who she wanted. Uh, and the negotiations with me over the phone were to get it through very quickly. And then, of course, Judge Goddard, even though she's a fantastic choice, uh, didn't get started for three months after that. Um, so more resources, of course, uh, and the ability to kill the bill. If they think the chair of a select committee... If the Secretary of State for Health believed that Sarah Wollaston could kill a bill and hold it up because she was the chair of a select committee in the House of Commons through a mechanism, my God, he'd be having her to tea every day um, because uh, he would listen and understand that these are people with real experience and real expertise, which is what we have. We offer government great expertise, as I say to ministers and civil servants all the time, we are your backstop. If we find out the problems, then you're not going to be on Newsnight trying to explain them to Jeremy Paxman or whoever his successor is. Um, so, you know, work with us, and we are a very, very effective way of helping you. So more resources. It needs to be seen as an alternative career structure. It is now, okay? I mean, Sarah doesn't wake up every day waiting for David Cameron to give her the call to become the health secretary, because she's on well. par, <laughs> on par with the health secretary. And I don't wait to get David Cameron to ring me up and become the home secretary, um, because I don't want to be, you know. This is not the right thing for me to do at this stage in my life. Um, but um, I think that they need to work with us more. They don't, they don't need to be afraid. They're afraid, and we need them to understand that we can work with them and we can actually get things moving. Um, the ability of, of select committee chairs, I've not had many urgent questions. Um, we did on G4S, of course, which was catastrophic for the company when we started. We started with an urgent question, we ended with a select committee hearing, and then a report, and then, of course, a resignation. A resignation is always very helpful to know that you've done the right thing. Um, people tend to resign before they come to us, uh, rather than after they've been. Um, but, uh, you know, we don't actually, that's a, that's a joke, by the way, so don't tweet that. We don't want people <laughs> to resign. Um, we, <laughs> we want people to feel that little bit of fear. Uh, I have to tell you, I had a little bit of a heart murmur last year, and they put a 24-hour monitor on my heart, and it was in the middle of a um, select committee session. Not They didn't put it on in the middle, it was on, and I said yeah. to members of the committee, if you're a bleeping, it's because I've got a 24-hour heart monitor. And when they took the uh, monitor off me and they showed me the results the two hours I was chairing home affairs was off the scale <laughs> it was so stressful for me forget about the witness because um, it's really stressful for us isn't it Sarah to know when to, to, to call people and what to say to them um, 
All party groups, I'm not a great fan of all party groups working with select committees. I think we have a different role. Um, I've al always seen all party groups as groups that should do speaker meetings. Um, and I see a lot of police officers, senior police officers, go to the policing group. I'm glad, because we can't get them all in to see us. Because ours is very inquiry-based. But I see them, uh, I've never really had much contact with the chairs of the various all-party groups, because um, they never asked to talk to me, and I've never really asked to talk to them. I think we have different roles. Um, and I think, but this is something we might look at, Lewis. Um, uh, and we might just get a list, Kiki, of all the all-party groups that operate in our area. And, and have a chat with them because um, you know, that might be a very good... You see, there's FGM, the all-party group and FGM uh, on policing, on bits and pieces. It's a good idea. I think we'll do that. Well, let, let me bring Sarah in on that because, of course, you sat on the all-party group on cycling, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, quite influential and got quite a good reception during the last parliament. One wonders if its recommendations are being taken forward by anybody now. Mm. Well, I, I think there is a, an important role between the two. and in, in a sense, there is some crossover, so some of the evidence from that fed into our, uh, our select committee in, um, in diet and physical activity and health. But... But you no, know, like Keith, I think they are very separate roles, but there, there can be some liaison. So, for example, I will have conversations with the, the chair of the all-party um, group on, on cancer, and there is a two-way flow there. He will sometimes suggest things that he thinks that our committee could look at, and I will suggest things that I think their committee could look at, because there just simply isn't time for the health committee to examine all the issues that come before us. So I'm um, thinking about a, an important issue around um, the use of bogus cancer testing, for example, uh, where, for example, women are being... Um, persuaded that there's a there's a scan that's going to be um, of higher value for them which they um, which it has no meaningful role to play in the, the detection of cancer and certainly hugely inferior to the the standard test that's available um, that's an area that the health select committee probably wouldn't have time to look at as a one-off inquiry although we might be able to if it was something like looking about whether there should be an extension to the cancer act to take in diagnostics as well as um, treatments uh, for cancer but it is something that i've suggested to john barron that maybe the all-party group could look at this issue um, because it's very important the whole issue of, uh, of bogus cancer testing so that, that's the way i think that select committees and all party groups can work together uh, have we got some more takers? Gentleman over there. Um, I think uh, my name is Nathan. Um, I think it is absolutely I'm sorry, I didn't right. quite catch. Nathan, sorry. Nathan. <laughs> I think it is absolutely right that the um, committees obviously follow a media lead. There's obviously evidence there of public interest. But I just kind of wanted to leave with reassurance that um, when the media's uh, reporting of Parliament is so limited, uh, with Mark's honourable exception, but it has to follow a, a small number of issues. You know, we kind of think back to the pages and pages there were, in, I guess, in Victorian times about Parliament, but the, the, the media can only cover so many issues. And I guess I wanted to leave with reassurance and reminders of areas where select committees have picked up issues that were very much below the radar, they were very much perhaps affecting, you know, small numbers of people. And, you know, then essentially we're not just following um, what the media say are the big issues and, and where we'll get headlines. But, you know, there's that forensic work um, and things that aren't sexy aren't, aren't creating headlines. Okay. Paul Evans. Paul Evans. Um, a lot of the power of the congressional committees, so I admired, is because they hold the purse strings. Um, but when we try... It's, not all, it's quite difficult to get set committees interested in appropriations, um, particularly because it might involve moving money from one place in order to put it somewhere else within the envelope of a particular department. Do either of the chairs have any idea how we might get committees more interested in the appropriation process? Keith, would you like to have your hands on the well, Home Office purse strings? Yes, uh, I would. Um, and... Um, we would come to you to get advice, Paul, because of your huge knowledge on these issues, um, to help us do that. But it would be great to be able to do that. The trouble is we only examine uh, the permanent secretary once a year, uh, and he's the guy who is the accounting officer. So if we want to be involved in moving money from one envelope to the other, it does take um, uh, a lot of forensic knowledge, uh, which and we don't have the expertise. So... 
um, in, as you are almost head of clerkery, find us the clerks uh, who've got that expertise uh, rather than people that we need to necessarily train to do that job. And we will happily take them. Nathan's point, um, I think FGM, though FGM had been worked up quite well by the All Party Group, um, I feel we played a part uh, in making sure that people were more aware of it um, and getting the first prosecution. I remember that the DPP uh, appeared before us on the Tuesday and lo and behold, on the Friday, someone had been arrested um, for FGM. Of course, they lost the case, but that was good. And I don't think it's a mainstream issue, but I think it's now been made mainstream. And of course, I mentioned the Gurkhas. That was not an issue that was... Um, very much in the public domain till Joanna Lumley took it up and approached us and we then did some hearings and then it became much more well known. Um, uh, on, on the point about coverage in Parliament, I don't know who, who mentioned that. Who is that? Nathan as well. Oh, Nathan as well. I think they actually cover um, select committees better than they cover the chamber. I mean, Anne Treneman in the Times, of course, always does the sketch but that's not quite a faithful report, uh, reporting of what goes on in, in, in the press. Most of the, uh, I, I read the Times, so most of the Times is probably about government announcements, opposition collapsing, uh, all that kind of stuff, rather than what X, Y, and Z said in the chamber, because ministers choose to make speeches outside the chambers, chamber to announce policy. The prime minister didn't come before the chamber today to talk about his five-year plan, he went to Birmingham. Um, so we have the opportunity tomorrow to ask the Home Secretary about it. Um, and uh, I, I often, every Sunday, the last thing I do is read In the Committee Corridor by Mark Darcy, because that tells me um, where we are in his pecking order and which particular committee he wants to highlight. Uh, and part of my great ambition is to make sure that we are always chosen as his pick of the week. Uh, and on a Sunday, I give out a cheer when it's in his uh, top uh, billing. Blush. Uh, <laughs> Sarah, um, the, the two questions really, um, the balance between being media-led and making the news, and would you like your hands on the NHS purse strings? Well, I tell you what, I think the, the issue around mental health budgets, for example, um, we legislated for parity of esteem, we put it in the, uh, the mandate. Um, has it happened? No. If anything, we went the other way during the last parliament. And I have to be careful of this it, uh, to, to uh, uh, state an interest, and that is that I'm, I'm married to an NHS psychiatrist, but that's not why I feel strongly about this. Um, because it, but it, it is a really serious problem if you look at the issue raised in our, um, our report on children and adolescent mental health services, only 6% of the entire mental health budget is going uh, on children and adolescent services. It's been woefully inadequate for as long as I can ever remember um, in, uh, in the health service when, when I was in practice. Um, so just 6% of a budget which is of itself um, tiny in comparison to the need. And so, yes, I would love to have the power as a select committee chair to hold them to account because that's something that interests me when I called, um, spoke to Simon Stevens about this last year, was to say, who, who do we hold to account? Who is responsible if parity of esteem doesn't happen? And, and his response was, well, that would be me, um, that, that he needs to deliver on that. But... What does that actually mean? Um, how do we actually make sure that parity of esteem happens? Uh, and I think that select committees need to, to have a, um, a, could do with having a bit more power to making sure that those policy commitments are actually then carried out. Well, we've got a few moments left, so I'm afraid I'd like to be selfish again and um, ask one further question, which is Sarah, something Sarah touched on, which is the treatment of witnesses. In the last parliament, we saw some occasionally pretty fiery sessions, the famous occasion when the Public Accounts Committee forced a senior civil servant to swear an oath to tell the truth, uh, which was pretty good. Then we saw the um, 2007, was it, series of hearings with the top bankers, the masters of the universe, which some people thought was the nearest thing to putting them in the pillory. So how far should 
committees go with witnesses who aren't perhaps giving them the information they want? What are the limits? What are the kind of cultural inhibitions on that kind of behaviour? And are we seeing people getting noticeably tougher now they feel that they've got a much stronger basis to stand on, Keith? I think uh, this is overplayed. Uh, people complain, the media complains if we're too tough on witnesses. Uh, they complain if we are too weak. I remember after Robert, um, Rupert Murdoch came in, the complaints about members of the committee who they said was, were sucking up to, uh, uh, to, Mur to Rupert Murdoch and others were too hard on him. So we could never win on this. Um, I think Is that there a kind of a Goldilocks area where you're not too hot and not too cold but just right? <laughs> I think Sarah and I are very good examples uh, of people who are absolutely Goldilocks would do well coming to either of our committees um, because uh, we are very fair. Um, obviously being polite to them is important, but they're not there, it's not a tea party. They're there to answer questions and they're there to help us come to solutions and conclusions. And um, it's always worth starting with I'm sorry <laughs> uh, if they've done something wrong. Uh, for those are the, those who come to the, for the topical areas that we have, um, and just getting on with it because I think that prevarication never works. With, uh, of course, we are a different breed. We will sort of never say sorry, and we prevaricate all the time. But we expect our witnesses to be able to do that to be really effective. What are the really deadly effective. sins, if I may interject again? What are the deadly sins? What really is a red rag to a bull to a charging select committee? I think that um, if you are too flippant as one of the witnesses was during the phone hacking, when he sat back, I think it was a, um, a former chief uh, at the Met, and uh, talked about uh, a very blasé attitude to checking the emails of people who had, which had been hacked. I think Lorraine Fulbrook got very, very angry with him and called him a dodgy geezer. And it, and it got on the 10 o'clock news um, uh, David Winnick, when Buckles came, Mr. Buckles came for G4S, said it was a complete and utter shambles, which actually was the whole session in, 30, in about five seconds. Um, uh, so we do, we, um, I give a prize at the end of the year for the soundbite of the year. I never win uh, that one. Uh, you, you must be shocked, yeah. So um, with ministers, ministers, we're more robust with ministers. I mean, the mood changes when we have a lay person who has never given evidence before. A lot of people are getting training doing this now. I'm sure Hannah would, if she sets up a consultancy, she'd be in great demand um, for as a second job, Hannah, um, because people are getting training to do this. And they are, you know, very, very, um, some are very good at it. Very polite, very open, very transparent, tell you everything you want to know. Is there anything else? And the, the best line of all, of course, is to say, if you don't know the answer, I will definitely write to you, to which I always say, by noon on Friday. Uh, for some reason, this is stuck in my brain, noon on Friday. And I always ask for it by noon on Friday. Because if you don't give them deadlines, they just don't reply. And, um, uh, you know, uh, they do try very hard now. The Home Office is notorious for not replying on time. They now all reply. Kiki, I think Broken Shy was about an hour late. We berated him, but, <laughs> but um, you know, it's pretty good. Sarah? I think Andrew Lansley was particularly irritating because he just used to machine gun you with data, and, uh, and uh, that was the, one of the things that sometimes people will come in and they'll have mm. their line and they're not going to shift from that line. It's sort of almost as if it's a news night performance, and whatever the question is, they're going to give you the same answer, or they'll say things like that well, that's not really the question, is it? That's, a, that's one way to wind a select committee up by telling them that that wasn't really the question they should be asking. Um, and uh, like Keith, when, when people are flippant or when people are, um, are really just clearly not able to grasp how serious an issue is. So one of the witnesses before our committee uh, was, uh, was following the, 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 the selling of hospital episode statistic data to, um, to uh, insurance companies. And a complete failure to understand why this mattered to people and why it was undermining um, the care.data program, which has enormous potential benefits, but failing to understand why people's personal medical data matters. Um, and so when you have a witness in front of you who, who is uh, rather patronizing and telling you they don't really understand how important uh, 
care.data is, and you can see that they can't really understand how important people's confidential medical data is, then you can run into a problem. But whether or not it was right for one of the members of the committee to shout at this witness, you should be in prison, um, I'm not sure that uh, that helped either, because then we, we just found ourselves into a confrontational hearing uh, where it's kind of ground to a halt. So it, 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 but so it, it is, it's a tricky balance. How do you get that right? Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think we've come to the end pretty much of our allotted time, but I'd like to thank our two uh, witnesses, dare I say, for some quite fascinating thoughts about the inner workings of select committee land. Uh, so if you'd like to uh, signify your thanks to Keith Vaz and Sarah Wilson, you will well. We never get applause, so we're very grateful. <laughs> Uh, and that, I think, concludes the evening's festivities. Thank you very much indeed for coming. It's been a great uh, occasion.